Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome everybody, students and members of faculties and schools of architecture across Canada. Bienvenue à la 11e et avant-dernière conférence de la série pan-canadienne Global Perspective. Uh, mon nom est Ariane Ouellet-Pelletier, je suis coordonnatrice responsable des affaires externes ici à l'École d'architecture de l'Université Laval. Et c'est notre tour de vous proposer une conférence sous le thème de la diversité. Euh, une conférence que l'on tient en partenariat avec le projet de recherche Habiter le Nord du Québec, euh, Living in Northern Québec. Uh, so this lecture will be conducted in English. Today we have the pleasure to have Wanda de la Costa as lecturer. Uh, Ms. de la Costa, thank you for accepting our invitation and for joining us today from Arizona, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we also welcome Elisa Gouin, who is joining us tonight too. Elisa is one of our PhD students, a collaborator on the Living in Northern Quebec Research Project. Her research, funded by the Fonds de Recherche, Société et Culture du Gouvernement du Québec, focuses on co-design in intercultural contexts. Elisa will introduce our lecture and moderate the Q&A session after the talk. Speaking of Q&A, Uh, we invite you to write questions during the lecture using the Q&A tab, which you'll find just at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll make sure to uh, address those at the end of the session. So, uh, Elisa, je, je, je te passe le micro. C'est bon. Ben, bonsoir à tous. Ça me fait vraiment plaisir de vous présenter la conférencière d'aujourd'hui, Wanda Dalacosta. Donc, elle est d'origine CRI et membre de la Première Nation Saddle Lake CRI en Alberta. Euh, et c'est la première femme à avoir obtenu le titre d'architecte parmi tous les membres des Premières Nations au Canada. Euh, Mrs. Dalacosta holds the Master of Design Research from the Southern California Institute of Architecture and a Master of Architecture from the University of uh, Calgary. In 2018, she was part of the Indigenous delegation representing Canada at the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Biennale d'Architecture de Venise. Uh, today, Wanda Dalacosta is the director and founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative at Arizona State University and principal of Tawa Architecture Collective, which she found in 2010. As you may have heard, her talk will focus on the decolonization of design from an indigenous perspective and will draw on four concepts from indigenous cultures, futurity, placekeeping, pluriverse, and design as ceremony. This will be an opportunity for, for all of us to learn more about indigenous design practices and to discover relevant tools specific to these processes and research. Uh, je vous invite à écouter la conférencière attentivement, à écrire vos questions dans le bloc uh, questions et réponses uh, à même le Zoom, puis on va pouvoir uh, échanger avec la conférencière à la fin de sa présentation. Uh, welcome, Mrs. Dalla Costa. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. It's very, I'm very happy to speak to a group of architecture students. Um, wonderful, wonderful to be here. We normally do an acknowledgement, but I think um, over the last year, I've decided to, instead of doing an acknowledgement, um, I am in the land of the Akma, Otem, and Peeposh. I ask, what are we going to do about it? If we know whose land we're in, what will we do? Um, are we, you know, thinking of actions instead. So I just want to leave you with that concept. I'm excited today to talk about four Indigenous-centric concepts and to look at how we think about decolonizing design from an Indigenous perspective. Through the concepts I'll share, which she mentioned at the beginning, futurity, placekeeping, the pluriverse, and design as ceremony, as well as a few, a couple of projects that I've peppered in uh, the talk. I hope to leave you with not only an awareness of Indigenous design, but to leave you with some tools to add to your own process and research, as well as a few pathways in terms of a career to consider. As you head into your practice in the next few years, we ask potentially some of you to join the movement, perhaps as a futurist, perhaps as a placekeeper, or perhaps using your tools in design to enlarge the notion of design as ceremony. Tawau means welcome, so thank you for having me. Here are the four concepts that I wanted to share with you today. Before I get to the fourth, 
I want to share with you the research mechanisms by which I do this work. So the three that you see on screen, um, both the research uh, organization here at Arizona State University, my private firm, Tawau Architecture Collective, which we often call Tau, and finally my lived experience. So this is where I am situated in the US. If any of you have seen this map before, all of the colored portions on this map are all the reservations across North America. As you can see, where I am situated is a very dense area. We are home in Arizona to 22 tribes. What does that mean for Arizona State University and for the work that I do? That means we have 55,000 youth in the pipeline, Indigenous youth in the pipeline. That means we get 3,000 Indigenous youths coming to ASU. And what is most remarkable is that we get 52 Indigenous design students every year. So it is very much a think tank over here. They're in various fields of design, but they are all in the design school. Our vision at the IDC is really preparing the next generation of designers to act as field transformation ambassadors through the power of place design and cultures-based innovation. Our mission, really, when I think, when I drill down to think of what our mission really is, it's really about increasing the understanding, it's increasing inclusiveness and accuracy in the field, while at the same time illuminating undervalued or under-examined ancestral worldviews and value systems that can contribute to global transformation. The Indigenous Design Collaborative, uh, myself, uh, I founded it in 2016, but we now brought on Claudio Vextein. He's an award-winning architect from Argentina who also helps mentor students. We typically have four, sometimes more students at any time working for the, for the group. And we have now hired one intern to work with us to help us uh, manage the organization. The other uh, body that I operate through in terms of uh, doing research and understanding this subject more is my firm. And when I try to articulate a vision, it's difficult because our work as in the field of Indigenous architects isn't um, narrow, it's quite broad. And so the closest definition that I have to be able to share my practice is that it's a space of possibility, plurality, relationality, collaboration, spatial agency, and resilience and we do some architecture as well. Our focus um, specifically is on integrating Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. It's really about our methods, about participatory uh, design. It's also about mentoring the next generation and growing uh, the next generation to a very strong and vocal and uh, empowered group. And then finally, four and five, what you see on the screen, it's really about changing the approach to uh, focus on um, a multi-generational, but also an Earth-centric approach. The last um, mechanism that I use as an experience of this work is my upbringing, my lived experience. This is my grandmother. She's always in my presentations. This is up on the Sad Lake Reservation. This is her house with no running water. These are well, about three quarters of my cousins, there, there are definitely more. And this here is the beautiful playground um, that we were blessed to have uh, growing up. Uh, the reservation was about an hour away from the city that I grew up in. So it was very close and we got to spend a lot of time growing up. Let's talk about the first concept, the notion of plurality. As many of you are aware, I live in the US and there has been some issues with diversity in this country, as many of you have probably seen in the news. We also need to understand that this country by the year 2045 will be a majority minority. That means that there will be more diverse people in this country than there will, there will be non-diverse people. This is significant because this is happening worldwide. How do architects play a role in the movement? For me, I believe that uh, creativity and imagination, which sit at the heart of artistic practice and the heart of architecture, um, we can enable those qualities in pursuit of political and social change. When we look at the major progressive movements of the last century, the settlement houses, the African-American um, civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid struggle, the Arab Spring, what we see are groundswells of music, dance, theater, 
visual arts, poetry, storytelling, digital media, theater, film, and so forth. Artists, whether working in collaboration with political actors or simply inspired by the changing times, are able to use their art to recruit people into the movement, to reframe how we understand ourselves in relation to the world, and to help us envision new possibilities. One of the pictures that I typically share with the students that I teach is this beautiful project that is by an Indigenous artist in Bolivia. There's a waiting list for his work. And as I imagine how many plur plurality or plural pluralism concepts are emerging worldwide, both in architecture and urbanism and a multitude of other creative fields. I look at this and I ask, is it right? The color, the form, the playfulness, the uniqueness of this structure, it is not what we teach in architecture schools, but is it right? And to me, I think in a world filled with infinite diversity, there are dominant narratives that shape our perceptions of the world. Consequently, the worldviews and the realities that differ from the status quo become suppressed. And I think concepts of Indigenous worldviews become unthinkable from the perspective of a Eurocentric theory. And unfortunately, over time, they have been gradually undervalued and invalidated over time. The pluriverse, to me, acknowledges and validates humanity's diversity and also its interconnectedness. Similar concept, which is coming out of New Zealand, a concept of plurality is the Maori people in uh, Auckland. So Te Aranga, many of you I'm sure are aware of this, is a uh, set of urban principles based in Indigenous values. You see the values on the left, just beautiful, absolutely gorgeous principles about connection with the natural world, hospitality in a city, um, unity, cohesion, uh, belonging. Who wouldn't want these qualities in a space, in a city that they occupy? And I think more beautiful about these concepts is they are articulated not just for the obviously not just for the Indigenous people of the place, but they're intended to enhance all of our appreciation of the natural landscape and its connection to the built environment. At the same time, this beautiful system of Te Aranga allows us to understand what a culturally appropriate design process and a design response looks like. Before we get on to a project that I'll share with you that to me uh, speaks, to, or a couple of projects that speak to plurality, I wanted to share with you a definition of indigeneity or indigenous uh, peoples. This is provided by the United Nations and I often alert people to this definition because the more I read this definition and the more I think about concepts of plurality of all the global diverse people around the world, I look at this definition and I really do believe that it is much broader than the Northern North America, Native North Americans in North America. Uh, I believe that if I looked at, particularly if you look at number seven, those who resolve to maintain and reproduce ancestral environments. That could be Shanghai, it could be Dubai, and it could be Phoenix. So when I think about plurality, I think there's a really beautiful um, expansion happening right now in our time, not only by the increasing diversity in our world, but the increasing openness to what that means. How does it impact our profession? So the two case studies, and I've just brought a slide on each because I just want to share with you and hint at the work that we're doing. Um, the first, in terms of plurality, we've started working with the city of Tempe here in Phoenix. It's um, they have a native councilwoman and she's from the Navajo Nation and we are working at indigenizing, similar to, to Te Aranga, we are working at indigenizing that city. What does it mean to the local, there are three uh, tribes, we still use the word tribe in, in America here, there are three first peoples communities or tribe, tribal communities that sit, are situated surrounding the city of Tempe. What do they envision the indigenization of this indigenization of this city to be? So we're we've just embarked on a, a beautiful process that will hopefully bring those beautiful concepts of Te Aranga here to North America. Perhaps it's the first indigenization project in North America. The second case study that we're doing at the IDC that I wanted to talk about. And again, just a single slide. I think it's mostly important because there is a rebirth happening in Hawaii. 
we found out we were invited to come and sit with a local group, Kamehameha Schools. They uh, are in charge of, of educating their diverse Indigenous groups there, but at the same time, they've been given a trust and it allows them to develop. And so they're in an optimum position. Um, unfortunately, they are experiencing a number of challenges in Hawaii. Many of you who have been there understand it's a gorgeous place and everybody does want to go and visit Hawaii, but they are feeling displaced, a loss of control over the land, a loss of identity, overdevelopment is hampering um, the environment. There is a lack of self-determination and now they're starting to feel like a minority in their own homeland. One of the biggest issues they brought up when we went to visit with them was the, the unfortunate occurrence of misrepresentation. They said their identity is ill-conceived, manufactured, and fabricated by external forces. So I think the notion of how we are represented as Indigenous peoples is going to become an increasingly important topic in the future of architecture, design, and many of the creative fields. Let's talk about the second um, big concept, uh, Indigenous futurity. So here we are, the first concept talked about the pluriverse, a world filled with diversity. But yet here we are, suppressed, undervalued, invalidated over time. Where do we start? Fortunately, we as architects, uh, with the power of creativity and imagination, can suggest and artists have been doing this for many, many years. And I think the concept of Indigenous futurity to me has been very, very instrumental to being able to rethink how to decolonize the design process. The term was expressed and coined by Dr. Grace Dillon. She's a professor of Indigenous Nations at Portland State University. IF or Indigenous Futurity, is really the past future visions where we construct self-determined representations and alternative narratives about our identities and our futures. What's important is that this notion challenges the assumptions that consign Native American peoples and their life ways to the past, and it uses creative thinking as a pathway toward revival or the rebirth that is happening in many communities around the world. If you delve into the sources that are listed under the photo, you will hear that IF is emerging in many disciplines, many creative dif disciplines from art to medicine, to gaming, to architecture, which is the portal of my reimagining the future. The base belief of indigenous futurity is really that our actions toward our future are important. It makes some futures likely and others less likely. These reimagined worlds have also been called ethnoscapes. Many of you know that word from the movie Black Panther, uh, the city of Wakanda. I want to read you a passage of an Indigenous artist who was examining in, or who was activating Indigenous futurity. The artist's name is on the left, and I'll read you a passage about her work. Storytellers remembering futures from the past takes place in a new world, seven generations from now, the earth has become uninhabitable and humankind has been forced to find a new home amongst the stars. The Dene have moved to a planet with two moons who hold the world in balance. This world is the fifth world in the Dene creation story. The people have terraformed the planet to look like their home in Round Rock, Arizona. The Hogans, which are the traditional Dene homes, are partially made of glass and rigid woven panels. The image depicts storytellers who are remembering the creation stories and archiving them to be shared later. They use a form of telepathy with each dot representing a story from the Dene history. The piece is intended to show the resiliency of cultures of the people, the stories, and how all of that is maintained through the and nourished through the matrix of our families. Who is doing IF? So you see on the screen the IIF, which is the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, is a partnership from between universities and community organizations dedicated to developing multiple visions of Indigenous peoples tomorrow in order to better understand where we need to be today.
They offer workshops, residencies, symposia, and archives, all to encourage and enable artists, academics, youth, and elders to imagine how we and our communities will look in the future. It's based out of Concordia University. Who else is doing uh, IF work? This is another group. They're called Cultural Organizing, and they work at the intersection of art, activism, education, and culture. So I encourage you to dig to their websites and do a little bit of research. I want to leave you, before we uh, move away from this notion of Indigenous futurity, I want to bring an example, and I have done an, exa an uh, elaborated example of a case study from our um, firm. This was a collaboration between Dave Fortin uh, architecture firm, Eladia Smoke, Smoke Architecture, and my firm. Uh, back a couple of years ago, it sits, the site sits directly across from the Canadian Parliament. And unfortunately, they gave us uh, to do a conceptual design of what it was a scoping exercise. They gave us a colonial building to redesign. And as I share often, as we wiped our tears away from being given a colonial building to redesign, we went to work. The site is here directly across from the parliament. This is the project site. Our team, we thought it was important that we brought someone who could represent not only the local territory, who people from the region, but also the three large Indigenous groups in Canada, the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis. We also had an elder on team, on our team, to help us understand uh, and help us be to be the moral compass for directing the project. There were many uh, parts of this wonderful, rich pr uh, project that were inspirational. And I think for me, one of the special places were all of the research that was done and how those concepts came alive into the final form. So often within our firm, we study local meaning in traditional archetypes, such as the wigwam, which is what you see here on that first line. Then we look to material culture. What can we be inspired by? Then finally, we look at regalia or any other physical objects of the region, looking for ways that we can bring that into a layered, um, a layered design in the final project. You see here on the left, a final model of the project. And when you zoom in close up, each of these feathers, some people see feathers, some people see snowshoes, but what we wanted to do was have each one of these elements to represent each of the 617 First Nations in Canada, as well as the Inuit and the Métis communities, each having an element of expression on a building, telling the Canadian public, we are still here. The plans, as you will see, are very organic. They uh, move away from the traditional colonial structure that you saw in the early picture. These, this is the roof plan, and you will see the references to Father Sky, the organic shapes. You will also see the programming that is specific to Indigenous people. These are gathering spaces, vitally important for continued lifeways for our group. The one on the left is at the top of the structure. The one on the right is at the lower end of the structure. They, the one on the right exists around a sacred fire, which was important part of uh, truth and reconciliation for the country of Canada. Another one of my special um, parts in this project was a soup kitchen. Our elder asked us, what do we do with the people that aren't in soups, suits that live inside the city of Ottawa? What she was getting to was an Indigenous value system. And to me, value systems, I think, are an underutilized asset in architecture. Here, she was alluding to inclusiveness, perhaps generosity. Uh, and I think these, the value systems of local peoples, become alternatives to purely assessing architecture from an economics or a purely aesthetic point of view. What else does it do besides bring beauty? to a place, what else can it do? So this leads me to number four, the Indigenous Placekeeping Framework. Our framework has a four part process. I created this when I started teaching at Arizona uh, State University or just before I started. And it was really a way of teaching students how to do this work. It's very simplified, but since then we've developed a series of practices with it within each of the four quadrants. 
people often ask me, how is this different from creative placemaking? You see the definition of CP on the screen, which is the act of care and maintenance of a place and its fabric by the people who live and work there using creativity. I would add to that, that if we are working as Indigenous placekeepers, we are also bringing in citizen experts with the lived experience. We are also looking for local value systems. We are looking at lo local assets that the community can bring. We are including Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and connecting as well as, val as, well as the value systems. And we are utilizing holistic measures of wellness. So they might not be aesthetics or economics. They could be social, cultural, spiritual, or physical. So let's go through each one of these four, and I'll give you a number of practices within each. So number one, community-led. Vital to the success of each project is a pathway that will lead to truly collaborative process. At Tau, at our firm, and at IDC, this means that the community members become partners in the process from day one. While we as architects offer the technical assistance in building the community's vision, we believe that it is the community members who should define the problem and advise on the pathway to get us there. Some of the practices that we have developed within our community-led quadrant include inquiring right at the beginning, who are the citizen experts? Who should be at the table? Uh, does the project require a period of self-definition where it's 100% Indigenous people sitting at the table so that the project doesn't become diluted. Um, who are the cultural advisors, the elders, the knowledge brokers? In other words, just really having an idea of what they feel a community-led process would look like. The second quadrant of our approach is process-based. For us, Indigenous architecture is heavily uh, heavily process based. It's not so much about the shiny object at the end, it's about how we get there. And it involves engaging Indigenous people as co-collaborators co in the production of context-specific architecture. There is no one-size-fits-all, as you can imagine, with 617 uh, diverse First Nations and a multitude of other diverse Indigenous groups. And what we've created is a suite of tools and processes designed to uplift those local narratives. We tailor those local processes to meet each local community. Our process is very transparent along the way, so our communities can come along for the full uh, length of the ride, understanding what uh, comes next in the process. A few of our sample practices, um, we often uh, operate a notion of watchful listening, which means we listen with our ears, not with um, by talking. Uh, I often have a 90-10 rule where we are to listen for 90% of the time that we're in community. It's hard, you'd be surprised how difficult that is. Um, we often leave time for open-ended conversations because we don't know all of the questions to ask. Sometimes we will um, get into um, our community member's car and just ask them to take us for a ride around the community in an unstructured way so that we can receive the stories from the community and the places um, that hold those stories. We often share um, that we don't want to translate their voice. We actually want to transcribe verbatim their words. So our research documents often have a full transcription behind them of the community's first-hand narrative. Lots can be lost in translation. We ask sometimes what are the local customs or norms, protocols? You know, what are their, what are their processes with data sovereignty? How much is an honorarium for local community members? Um, if anyone is familiar with the term syncretism, it's a, it's a new term to me, but it's about this amalgamation of different cultures. And for us, we actually try and take it apart before we merge them together. First, we want to take it apart to understand them each in, in their totality before we begin to merge. And that process is really, really important to understand um, what it is that we will eventually merge in the, in the final product. The third quadrant of our research process is place-based. So we aim for a really hyper-localized design. We know that community members bring generations of understanding, including the local history, the landforms, understanding of those landscapes, worldview, stories of place, microclimate patterns, and of course, all of the spatial cultural meaning. So we often share with our community, with our clients, that a large portion of our work is research. Their 
sh um, generosity sharing with us and our personal research in order to enlarge our understanding. To us, we are just a vessel through which their ideas flow. Some of the practices in terms of our place-based work, um, we study uh, their local archetypes really in depth. The form, the materials, the teachings that are informed. I come from the TP people and I know that everything has meaning from the poles to which way you enter to the flaps have cultural meaning. Each of the poles represent a value in our community. There are positions within that um, teepee that where people occupy space. There's a movement pattern that is, is honored. There are many um, processes associated with those local um, archetypes. And it's really important to understand how those can impact the way we imagine a place. And finally, our work at, through the Indigenous placekeeping framework is reciprocity driven. We try to rethink each project in terms of what it gives back to the local community. Like the soup kitchen in the AFN project, we ask how the project can be useful to the local community. Can we employ local trades? Can we inspire youth for careers in architecture? Can we create space for cultural practices to flourish? Can we think holistically in terms of outcomes? And can we honor that holistic theory, um, thinking through the full life of the project so it stays th right through construction documents? And of course, can we inspire or create dialogue with non-Indigenous people through these beautiful projects? So I brought a case study that I think exemplifies Indigenous placekeeping. When I came to Phoenix, there wasn't all I saw here in the city were these um, symbols on the freeways, if anyone's ever been to Arizona, and that was really the only record of Indigenous people in this area. And I was really curious. I know there's a lot of people, this is a very dense and um, rich area in terms of culture. And so we worked with a, a group of Indigenous artists. They're listed on the screen. And what they did was help us create an Indigenous language greeting wall. So these are all of the local greetings crafted into Indigenous um, calligraphy, a, a type of graffiti font by these beautiful artists and embedded in the library at Arizona State University. So when the students come in, they can see their communities represented. Similarly, in the same library, we're currently under um, undertaking a table project with a local Indigenous artist, a very well-known artist. He was looking at the basket designs, which all have stories associated with them. So this is preliminary, but we'll, it will go in the same building that the greeting wall is in. The final section of this uh, talk today is about design as ceremony. And this is really about my hopes for the future. It's about places that I think we as architects need to be pushing. Many of you are probably familiar with the Cree scholar from Northern Manitoba who wrote the book, his name is Wilson, and he wrote the book, Research is Ceremony. And if you believe that research is ceremony, and I believe research is ceremony, I believe design is research. Well, it follows that design is also ceremony. So let me take you through the three things that I think um, I would like to push for in terms of architecture's path. I think, first of all, we need to really rethink the notion of empathy. Many of you are aware of the design thinking five part process, very simplified, of course, it makes it easiest to understand. But I think the notion of empathy is really difficult. And the quote that I have on screen shares the notion. This is from Barbara Brown Wilson, who wrote a wonderful book, Resilience for All. And in it, she talks, she tells us that the lived experiences of any place are important, but the situated experience of living in communities marked by structural classism and racism provides its residents with a unique knowledge that cannot be understood from outside observation. And so for me, I think if we can replace empathy with lived experience, it's a simple switch. That's all we need to do, bring in our citizen experts to help us. Number two, I think we really need to get uh, on board with studying cause and effect in design. The buildings you see on screen are two buildings that exist side by side in, a, in the Navajo Nation, which is in this uh, province, in this state of Arizona. 
two different architects. One is indigenous, one is not. You can imagine, uh, you can probably guess which one was created by an indigenous architect. But the main point is that the people of the Navajo Nation have widely criticized one of the buildings. They say it's, a, uh, it's too severe, the colors aren't right, the form isn't right, it doesn't re relate to the culture. And for me, this is a really serious uh, impact because if we're using so many resources to create these buildings in our communities, and if the communities don't align with it, you know that people will not love this building and it will not be taken care of and it will not be um, honored for uh, as much as a building that they love. The notion of speculative design is about this. It asks us to consider the effects of our de design on future societies. The last and final um, push I want to leave with you as we embark on, uh, as you embark on the future of your career, is that I think for, especially for decolonizing design and for Indigenous design, we do need to think about this in terms of the four aspects of an Indigenous research paradigm. Normally, researchers and scholars in the field do not touch one without touching the other three. So I think design should also get on board and bring in ways of being, knowing, and doing in axiology. And of course, all of those are only possible when we engage deeply in community. So the last, uh, it's two slides um, before we start the Q&A that I wanted to share with you is a simple case study. It was one of our very early projects early on, 10 or so years ago, we began this project. But to me, it exemplifies when you make room for other ways of knowing, doing, and being, you end up with a room like this. This was designed or co-designed, I guess you could call it, by a Blackfoot elder for teaching six-year-olds about our relationship with the earth, the sky and our place in the universe. You see the lines on the floor. These are the equinox and solstice sunrise and sunset lines. There are windows that go directly out to the outside world. This is the medicine wheel that he teaches within. This is the central sacred area that is intersected by the four directions. This school was our first test to see whether all four knowledges <clears throat> excuse me, in Indigenous thinking could be articulated in a school. And to me, I think it was a success. Um, we have heard, last night I did a presentation um, with the principal of the school. A lot of times we don't ask and we don't get feedback on our buildings, but I asked and I said, let's talk about this. And she shared the story in a presentation last night um, in Calgary about the uh, outcomes of this building. And what you see on screen is the feedback from the user group. Each of these were quoted last night. That school has become a place of cultural safety, belonging. The children apparently are happier than they have ever been in any school. They talked about them getting off the bus and being just glowing and happy to come into the center, as well as this school being a place of reconciliation. They are words of inspiration for me and for this work. And hopefully they inspire many of you to imagine your role in the Pluriverse as a placekeeper uh, or a futurist or both and also as a ceremonialist, ceremonialist in the pursuit of design as ceremony. Thank you. Hi, hi. You're on mute, Elsa. Classic one, sorry. Thank you very much for this inspiring, inspiring talk. So uh, we have a few questions. Um, oh, I'm happy because the first catch question I'm seeing, I wanted to ask. So I think it's a good question. Um, what is the role of non-Indigenous architects in decolonizing designs? What are some steps they can take to be allies to indigenous design sovereignty? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Great question. So I often share that indigenous design does not have to be done uh, by indigenous designers. And I share that um, if you have an, an, a process that honors um, all of the aspects that I'm sharing within and um, the you know, wonderful if you can practice under an Indigenous architect, 
anyone can do Indigenous architecture. But I think it's really bringing to light that full understanding of what it means and what it's aspiring to do. So the steps that I would think to take, join an Indigenous architecture firm if you can. There are 18 of us in Canada and I think we're increasing um, very quickly. There's 30 or four practices here in the US as well. Um, there are a number of wonderful schools. Um, Laurentian University, of course, is one of the leading uh, in Canada. I believe UABC is also um, starting to promote um, their programming in terms of uh, planning. And of course, come to ASU. We can teach through the, the Indigenous Design Collaborative and a number of courses that we take here. I also know that many of the communities or many of the practitioners and scholars around North America are starting to create online modules. So I would encourage you to um, uh, be in touch with the um, or local schools and organizations and be on the update lists to get those courses because I think there's, a, there's so much information emerging right now. Um, in addition to a number of publications that have just come out in the, in the last five years from Indigenous architects and artists working in the field. So I would encourage you to, to start it there. Wonderful question, thank you. Thank you for your kind answer. Uh, I think this can um, resolve internal conflicts in some of our students. Um, I don't have many questions in the q and r don't be shy please <laughs> but waiting for your question and um, i would like to know more about um your uh, your experience and um, uh, we're i am curious about uh, the futurity aspects i think it really um it really goes well with the work we do in our uh, research group uh, living northern Quebec and we've been experiencing um, like um, often people who come to activities say things like yes but what do we do after like we some sometimes we feel people receive this as like a dream or a Marvel movie <laughs> like you said and okay but what then how do you help uh, how do you like make people understand the, the pertinence and uh, I think you understand my question despite my English. <laughs> no, you. that's a lovely question. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, the futurity projects that we aim to do are really intended to be a little bit bold and a little bit shocking. And what we're aiming to do is to really get people's attention that we are still here. Not only that we are still here, but that our architecture doesn't look like a teepee or a hogan or a wigwam. It is very progressive. It is contemporary. It is meaningful. It is layered. It is rich. It is uh, authentic. And I think that is really the purpose is really to bring attention to this work by using extremely bold concepts that are very locally based. And so um, I, I, not every project can be a futurity project. You know, I think in, in some aspects, every project is a project of our future because we're, we're stitching together histories that have been lost into our spatial environments. So in, in a sense, every project is a futurity project. But to me, the most impactful are the really bold moves that get people's attention and make them ask why. Why does it look like that? Why has she incorporated that? Why is it? you know, ask questions is really the purpose of that. So thank you, great question. Thank you. And um, we have a few questions coming, so I'm gonna go in order. Um, Jonathan Bank asks, can you share more about involving indigenous youth in the design process? What have been your experience? Oh, this is such an important part of the work, you know, um, Many of you know, if you're familiar with Indigenous worldview, that part of our responsibility, once we are successful as Indigenous people, it's just an unwritten rule that we give back. And for me, I think the most important way that I can give back to the profession and to our communities is through inspiring youth, the next generation, to become architects. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, when I started specializing in this field, I don't think Indigenous design was a thing. 
And all of a sudden it's become a thing really, mm -hmm. really strongly in the last, I don't know, five or so years, everyone knows that there's a thing called Indigenous design. And so part of my, um, part of our mission at both the IDC and at my firm, where we mentor a number of youth in both uh, organizations is really to inspire them and to allow them to see how their culture is valued and um, brought the stories are uplifted within architecture. So um, some of the, the our strong um, um, activities that we do at the university, we hold every year an Indigenous design um, inspiring session where 500 students descend from all different um, tribal communities across Arizona. And we do an interactive session with them to inspire them to study architecture. So that's beautiful. I would love to turn it into a mobile bus and take it out to the res because I think you'd get even more inspiration. Um, but in terms of our firm, um, we hire straight out of school, a number of different architects. And we actually inspire them by allowing them to do a, a transfer placement into a local uh, architecture firm that we're working with. The third way that we um, help is that, uh, or that we work with our youth is that we, one of our main researchers, Selena, started something called the Phoenix Design Empowerment Workshop. So she works with very diverse youth in the city of Phoenix, and she encourages them, teaches them 3D school, 3D skills, and encourages them to consider design as a method of activism and a future career. So these are some of the ways. So I look, that's a great question because it's so very important in this work. We need more. There's so much to say. And I believe your work is so global. It's like in every, you're in every area. It's political, it's art, it's activism, it's social work. It's all everything at the same, at the same time. We have a lot of other questions. So I'm just picking some. Um, Someone is asking, I am curious about your thoughts on how does axiology affects capacities for, for understanding lift experiences? So no, this is good. Did, you, did you understand? No, and I can read it. I see them okay. on the screen. Right. So no worry, I'm reading as you're reading. So axiology, for those of you, um, it's, it's essentially value systems. And how does it affect the capacities for understanding? This is a really good question because if we have a, va a, a value system, you know, I think of myself, if I was transplanted to, I don't know, Kazakhstan, would I understand the local value system? Likely not. Would I hear differently? I probably would hear things a lot differently. And so I think this is really important. Um, and it's the reason why even when we're working outside of, you know, I'm Indigenous, I'm Cree, but when I'm working with Blackfoot or the Dene or, um, you know, Ojibwe, I, I don't understand the local value systems. I have a broad understanding of Indigeneity, but in order to have that local understanding and to be able to read the nuance of what they're thinking and what they're feeling, I really need a co-pilot. And so because of the shortage of architects, we often bring an artist with us from the local community as our partner. And we say, come with us, you're gonna be our co-collaborator. You need to help us understand because there are gonna be many things along the way that we do not understand. And those nuances will be lost on us because we are from outside of the community. The value systems, the axiology could be lost on us because we come with a different set of understandings. And so that's a phenomenal question. And my recommendation, bring a co-pilot from the community. A youth, you know, who's not exhausted. I know a lot of people are busy in this profession, but youth and artists have all the energy right now to help you navigate. So use them in abundance in this work. I think that's a great recommendation. And it uh, resonated me with a concept called gatekeepers or when you, we're working in indigenous communities, we often try to have what we call in French a portier. So the, a person who holds the doors and can connect in because it's an intercultural context, even if you're indigenous there and it just connect with the place based concept you were talking about earlier okay um there's just so many great uh, comments in the <laughs> q a people i think really enjoy your uh, 
your presentation. Okay, so I will take the question of Pierre Olivier de Mel. How do you work? You, how do you position yourself towards out of other way of designs? Since there is a great need for indigenous design, how can we translate indigenous way through other way and address or include a, bro a broader number of human perspectives? Let me just read. How do you position yourself? <laughs> <laughs> my, my brain was going all over the place. Let me just read it here. How do you position yourself toward other way of design? Since there's a great need for indigenous design, how can we translate indigenous ways through other ways and address or include broader number of human perspectives? So I, I feel like, and I think I understand the question, there are a number of I would call them synergistic, where they relate in concept to the work that we do. There are so many firms doing such amazing work right now. And to me, I think we're stronger together. So if we are to come together, you know, I recently heard of a, 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 an architecture firm that has biologists. They're a European firm that has biologists and archeologists in their practice. And I think this to me is the way architecture should be moving. It is, should not be siloed anymore. We need to open the doors and open the walls and allow all of that broad, um, that broad knowledge that surrounds not only our, our built environments, but our natural landscapes. All of that knowledge is so important to broaden. And so I would welcome that the notion of other perspectives, whether it's based in land concepts or other, other communities. And what, I, what I'm seeing right now in South America, there's a really strong push right now. And I imagine they will become co-collaborators and help us broaden um, the way we think, because there's a lot of really beautiful movements happening in South America to decolonize. So I think once we work together, I think this is where we, we're really going to start to make headway. So thank you for that's a great question. I hope thank I hit you. it right. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Yes. And uh, you were also answering other questions that maybe you have seen uh, people asking about landscaping. I, and I think your answer just about uh, deleting the, you know, the silos and working all together is really uh, the future. Maybe Ariane uh, wrote me, she had a question uh, for you. Yeah, I also have a question. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing lecture. Uh, I want to bring you back to your fourth theme, um, uh, placekeeping uh, framework, where you talk about the importance of process-based design, but you try to listen 90% of the time. This is very interesting, really, and I'm sure we, we can all see how difficult that can be, really, for sure. Uh, and I, I wonder how that translates uh, to your work as a professor of architecture. Because in many ways, in studios mostly, we have stu students to listen 90% of the time, but to their teacher or advisor. So it, it, in some ways, we see them become architects pleasing other architects, you know? So how do we, um, you know, uh, embed that into architecture e education as well? That's a, it's a really interesting question because uh, my classes have been called out as being quite unusual. And the reason for that, um, you know, our elders often tell us you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, you should listen twice as much as you speak. And I think for us in Indigenous design, it's even, you know, more of a 90-10 uh, ratio. But I think what changes in my class is that we are all teaching each other. There is a non-hierarchical, I don't sit above my students, we sit the same. They bring lived experiences this, that are at the same value as my lived experiences, and we teach each other. So our, our classroom is very collaborative. We sit in a circle, we dialogue. I am not the one talking for the full lecture, for the full hour, and we often get into breakout rooms now where that we're on Zoom or breakout discussions in small groups so that each person in that class can learn from the lived experiences of the other person. Does that change architectural education? I think it does because, you know, part of many of people who know me well, I backpacked for all of my 20s 
um, went to 40 countries on, you know, traveling around the world. And there was such an appreciation for the diversity of this world through that lens that I developed with a backpack on that to me, there isn't one way to look at the world. And I think there isn't one person that should speak to this world. There are many. Thank you. Uh, did we have other questions? Is that, you know, I, I don't see any. Um, once did you, um, they, they were a few, but I can't keep up, honestly. <laughs> but uh, I think you're, you had broad answers. So we maybe... have a, a, a last one. Is it okay we, if we uh, ask a last question? <laughs> sure. Good. We have one from Samuel Boudreau, who works for the research project at Pilnar as well. Hello, Samuel. Uh, COVID brings new challenges, uh, for example, reaching out to remote communities. In the past year, have you experimented new ways of mobilizing the communities you work with? And I know Elisa is having the same issues right now with her research, so I think a lot of people can be interested in that. Yeah, it's been really, really, really hard with COVID, um, but we've actually managed to translate all of our engagement processes into an online format. And what we're doing now, of course, my magic number on a Zoom is six, any more than that, no, and people stop, talk, stop talking. And so we have arranged a series of, of group chats over Zoom. We also do walk and talks with um, video recorders so that they, they can still walk the land and share with us the stories. Um, we often sometimes implant a local person in the field who can actually help um, create um, hybrid engagement sessions, even though we might not be there because we Arizona is quite um, um, infected right now in terms of COVID and so we don't wanna infect our communities. But another way we found that, that is really powerful is through social media. We are able to, um, create designs, put them online, survey monkey, and actually get feedback on our designs in live real time. So I would encourage you to explore a number of online methods for getting feedback. Um, but yeah, it has been challenging, but we've we managed to find, find a path forward. A great question. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Dalla Costa. I think I will let the... Um... Last words to Ariane, uh, that was a, a pleasure to hear you, very inspiring and I think everyone has really enjoyed and I hope we can meet uh, all <laughs> in real person someday to talk about it more fluidly and uh, dynamically, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, wonderful to be here. I think the, these words were perfect to, uh, to hand that, uh, that evening. Thank you again on behalf of the School of Architecture at, at Laval University here in, in Quebec, but also from all the 12 School of Architecture across Canada. I know we have a lot of students and also members of faculties uh, from many other schools when, that, that were here with us tonight. So uh, thanks everyone for being here and also uh, Wanda de la Costa for uh, for this great talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Have a good evening.